If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. How did you end up uh, hearing about Jerry? Was it through... Everett. Everett. Yeah, so Everett is, I mean, he's been doing, he's been trading stocks. He got into day trading that long ago. He worked for a financial company for a couple of years and he's been working that way for a while. And, you know, he's the one who also got me on to cryptocurrency way back when. And so, you know, much of the the research that I was reading was coming originally from him. And then I, I started asking him like, well, what are you, where are you getting this information, right? Before I go start investing my money. I was he to... was he being successful with his choices and stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's what, so I was interested enough with that. And then, but I'm, the, I'm not the type of person, and as much as I love my brother Everett, like I don't just like go throw my money at something without doing my own homework and research. So he sent me over one day, he sends me over this podcast and uh, I listened to it, and it's uh, follow the money. And I'm listening to the podcast, and I really like uh, the the host Jerry Robinson. And so then I kind of go down the rabbit hole of like listening to other hip episodes of his and other episodes that he was on other shows. And he was getting interviewed one time, and they're talking about his uh, his book, um, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. And I was like, "Fuck, this is right up my alley. Like, I want to I want to read this." So I picked it up, bought it, and read it um, a couple months ago. I haven't posted it on my Instagram yet because I've been waiting for when we were going to do the interview. So I'll post the picture and my review on the book. The book was incredible, and uh, I after that instantly wanted to get him on the show. And Everett totally fanboyed out when he found yeah out. yeah he was in here just yeah. like, <laughs> he was so <laughs> like, excited. Ooh. In this episode, we talked to him about like you know economics, cryptocurrencies, where you should invest. Uh, some, there was some conspiracy theory we kind of went well, over a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was a little controversial. He's got a, doesn't he have an, he has an online group, right? We have a discount set. Yeah, up so that people. Everett's actually belongs to that already. So Everett pays uh, for his money. He says it's incredible. He goes, I basically, because when he was killing it and doing so well, again, I was asking where he's getting his information. And then after we had him, he's like, oh yeah, no, I've been a part of his group. He's like, I'm on all his trades. Whatever trades he's doing, I've been following for a long time and I've done really well that way. So he has this this paid group that he does, which part of the deal was when we talked to him and had him on here, he said he would hook that up for our audience and stuff. And so, so this is like a group where you can learn about investments, learn about you know mm -hmm. the decisions you make and all that stuff. Right. It's important information. So Jerry Robinson, his book is Bankruptcy of Our Nation. You can find him on Twitter at FTM Daily. And then if you end up liking what he has to say and you want to join his group, uh, if you go to uh, mindpumpmedia.com forward slash FTM, uh, you get uh, you get hooked up. You get a discount. And then there's another link there, Doug. Why are there two there? Well, because either one of them works. So you, oh, can, okay. so you can either do follow the oh, forward follow the slash money. follow the money. So it's www.mindpumpmedia.com forward slash follow the money or forward slash FTM. Both of them will work. Either way, and you get kind of hooked up. Yeah, and it's in the show notes. So if, if someone's interested in this, if you're looking to invest, like you can click those show notes links. It'll take Excellent. you directly over there. Now, speaking of investments, there is no better investment you can make than the investment in your health. On yourself. When you are healthy, you are happier. You produce more. Uh, you probably do better at work. You have better sex. It's just a great investment. And the problem is a lot of times people invest a lot of time in their fitness and don't get a lot in return. And that's because their training programming isn't good. It's subpar. Now, MAPS programs are designed by very experienced personal trainers, myself, Adam, and Justin. They're very effective. Go read the reviews for yourself. They give great results. You spend less time in the gym, you get better results. Let me give you a quick rundown. If you're interested in maximum strength and muscle, that's MAPS Anabolic. If you want to train like an athlete and you want functional performance, that's MAPS Performance. If you want to sculpt and shape your body like a bodybuilder, physique competitor, or bikini competitor, or even if you want to get on stage and compete, that's MAPS Aesthetic. If you want to work out at home without equipment or on the road without equipment, that's MAPS Anywhere. And finally, if you need correctional exercise because of pain or joint dysfunction, or if you're a personal trainer and you want some tools that you can utilize on your clients to increase your value as a trainer, that's MAPS Prime and Prime Pro. You can find all of these programs at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are interviewing Jerry Robinson. So Jerry, if you don't mind, just a quick background, your background, just quick before we get into the interview and we talk about what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, 
My background is is funny. I mean, re- religiously speaking, I, I was born as a Jehovah's Witness, which was kind of a weird experience. Okay. <laughs> I was knocking on doors, people's doors at you know twelve and thirteen or fourteen. So I got. I don't have any nervousness anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you got yeah. sales yeah. skills, yeah. Right? yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so uh, whenever I uh, turned eighteen, uh, you know, kind of got job, started doing uh, some corporate stuff, started my own business, started my very first uh, dot com in two thousand. Uh, it failed pretty miserably, and uh, then I started another business that succeeded, and uh, then in 2010, 2006, seven, I started writing this book. It got published finally after the market crashed, because uh, nobody knew who I was, nobody cared. You know, it's bankruptcy of our nation in 2007. Yeah, when we, everything was going so great, did, free money everywhere. So I couldn't sell a book, and then of course I got I, the book sold, and it did really well, and so that changed my life. The book changed my life. So. I, we went on a speaking tour. I was on, you know, all the big networks and everything, doing all that. Uh, and then after that, I decided to focus on uh, teaching people these principles because I really desired to kind of help people, not just to write more books and write more books. I wanted it really one on one. So we created the website, the membership, uh, followthemoney dot com, and uh, my wife and I have been building it ever since, about eight years now, and we now live off the grid and. Uh, believe that the worst is yet to come. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Where did you, what drove you to learn so much about economics and our money system and all that? What was it? 9-11. Yeah, 9-11. I was a pretty big, uh, I think, because of my religious upbringing, I was really Mm pro-Republican. And so when the Iraq war began, I was really pro-Iraq war. You know, sadly, when I look back now, I think, gosh, what was I thinking? Mm. Um, and in, a, in uh, about 2003, 2004, I woke up, I started doing a whole lot of research and it drove me, uh, into a lot of economics. And so I went back to college late in life and got an economics degree so I could understand. And it didn't really help me, but the periphery stuff that I learned on my own, that helped me. So, uh, all the textbooks didn't tell me nothing, you know, yeah. supply demand curves. But whenever I started digging a little deeper, I started finding, Things like the petrodollar system, you know, that are in the book that I'm going to, we can talk about today. I think it's very important. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I think the, and economics always interested me because my mother was a stockbroker and I helped her study for the series seven when I was a kid. So I was already very familiar with the stock market and really was attracted to financial and numbers and everything. But uh, yeah, economics, I think. I, when I, I remember where I was talking to the college entrance counselor, I said, I don't know finance or economics. You know, which one should I do? I remember this when I was younger. And she said, well, she said, financial guys work in the back of companies and they create reports. And she said, economists rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do economics. <laughs> Very, very true. I got into economics uh, about 10 years ago. It, it, was, it wasn't because I loved economics. It was because I realized that that's... If I could understand economics, I could understand the system. I could understand politics. I could understand policy. Without that, it was just, you know, which one felt better or who was making the other guy look worse type of deal. Were you along that? Were you in that yes, same? Yes, absolutely. Mm. What was the first thing you learned that blew your mind? Uh, probably the fact that I think it was the the early recognition of the fact of the uh, 1971 pulling of the gold standard for the dollar. I think that was whenever I, I learned that probably in 2003. And I think when I fully went down that rabbit hole is where I, Mm. where I woke up when I realized that the dollar itself, I got one here. I'll talk about it in a minute, but the dollar itself is not backed up by anything. It's just the full faith and credit (laughs) of the federal government, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that, helped me realize that we were in some sort of problem. You know, there was some sort of problem here. So explain that for a second, because, you know, I want to assume that a lot of our audience has no idea what you mean by tying the money to the gold standard. How was money uh, or the value of money dictated before? And then what happened, you know, because there, there was a bit of, there was a process, right? That was the last string connecting it to the gold standard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the first, the first time that the, that the government took a, a blow at that, I think was when, who was it that was uh, telling people to turn in their gold? Uh, Roosevelt. That was Roosevelt, yeah. right? So so let's, let's talk about that for a second. What do you mean, you know, gold standard and what happened in 1971 and what is it now? 
Well, you know, there's, I, I think when you think about money, there's four stages of money. We talk about in the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. And the first stage is commodity money. So let's say that you and I, we all decide to start a new society. We start to decide to, you know, to create a commune. Well, we're going to have to decide on something to trade, you know, something to be the, the mechanism. And in times past, going back thousands of years, that's always been some sort of commodity, whether it's shells or sand or cows or, you know, gold or silver or whatever. I mean, whatever we decide, doesn't matter. Uh, and then over time, uh, as the society advances, money moves into a next stage. And that next stage is where we move into receipt money. And so, car- you know, carrying around eight cows or, you know, hoarding, you know, a whole bunch of gold or whatever becomes dangerous or impractical or whatever. And so at that point, uh, goldsmiths step in, kind of like the early banking. That's like our first bank, right? Yeah, our first bank, exactly. And these goldsmiths start showing up, and they hold your gold, and they give you a paper receipt that is as good as gold. And so now you can trans transact in your village or your community, and you have a slip, and you don't have to carry on all this gold, and you're not at risk. And then, of course, governments step in. This is number three. This is step three of the uh, of evolution of money. Governments step in and try to regulate the receipt money. They say, now, we, we don't know. We had all these different receipts. This guy's issuing receipts. This guy's issuing receipts. And we had a problem with this guy. We got to regulate this. It's like a free market for money receipts at this exactly. point. Which is what, uh, you know, which is what today, I think there's a lot of people who would like to see competing currencies. That's kind of what Bitcoin is. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's competing currencies. But, uh, and so what, when government steps in, they tend to regulate and they tend to over-regulate. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, in the case of the United States, they put forth a U.S. dollar, you know, and uh, they got rid of the receipt money based on commodities. And over time, uh, the United States dollar was based upon something like a commodity. It was based on gold. But in 1933, that changed. Now, right in the depths of the Great Depression, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt basically ended uh, the convertibility of the dollar into gold for you and I, for people like you and I. So before this, you could go to the bank, $20, give me $20 worth of gold, and they would have to give it to you. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you could actually trade these things. And why would you want to trade these things for gold? Well, what if your government started doing crazy things, right? What if your government started bombing other countries and then borrowing all the money to do it on a credit card? You know, you <laughs> Good might, example. <laughs> yeah, you might want to say, well, maybe I don't feel comfortable holding this. I'd rather hold gold and wait this out, right? And so you can certainly do that, but you, you don't have the same convertibility today as you did back then. And then uh, this lasted for, even though the people like you and I lost the ability to, to convert to gold, internationally, the international gold standard was still in place. The international gold standard uh, ends August 15th, 1971. There's a great Bonanza show on, and here comes Nixon to interrupt the Bonanza show to uh, tell us on live television, <coughs> President Nixon, that uh, uh, that's over. The gold window has been closed. And so that means that all nations around the world, France, Germany, anybody, could no longer take their dollars and trade them for gold on the international standard. And this, of course, was, you know, the shot heard around the world, so to speak. And since that time, since 1971, uh, we have been living in a totally pure fiat world. And the word fiat means by edict. In other words, this currency is not based upon anything at all, like it has been for thousands of years. The currencies that we use today they're backed up by the full faith and credit of the federal government. So 1971 was the year that everything changed. And since that time, the value of the dollar has fallen tremendously. Uh, Inflation has risen dramatically. We've seen stock markets, uh, especially the stock market here in the United States, boom, bust, cycle galore, because we're in this new, crazy, brave new world. Um, So yeah. What What is the success rate of fiat money? (laughs) <laughs> well, I think a lot of people don't know this. Yeah. Historically speaking, yes. Historically, historically speaking, yeah. what's what's the success rate? I mean, we're not using the Greek drachma anymore. Yeah. You know, we're not using the Roman denarii anymore. We aren't using the. We can go back and think of all of these different currencies that existed through time. They're no longer here. They one hundred percent fail. They one hundred percent fail. Time. That's yeah. that. That I think I remember hearing that when mm. reading your book, right? And that was one of the things that just kind of resonated with me. That blew mm. my mind. Is that 
historically speaking, we've never seen it succeed. What it, what makes us think that it's going to succeed? No, now? I think it's important that we 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 let people know why a government would even want to have a fiat currency if if there's a, a fail rate of a hundred percent. Because I know people are thinking, well, why would we? What's the reasoning behind that? Why would the government even want something to be fiat? And mm. I think it's important to communicate that before it being fiat, the government couldn't just print money because it had to be connected to a solid commodity, gold. So that means if the government wants to, <clears throat> you know, come out with a new government program that they promised or they want to start a war, which, you know, incidentally, we had World War you know, II after that. That was very mm -hmm. expensive or whatever. Um, that they can't just print money to, to pay for these wars, but if it's fiat and they control it, well, that, and that's what, that's what inflation is, right? Inflation is just flooding the market with a bunch of paper that doesn't, that, and, and when, when the value of it's based on how much of it's available, that means if you have $10,000 and there's, let's say a million dollars of paper dollars that are out there, government doubles that your $10,000 is now worth $5,000. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, when you go back in time, thinking about through history, you have like the conquistadors. Remember in history, they would go out and many nations would, you know, sail the seas and they would try to conquer a new land and then they would take the gold. Well, the gold was important because it allowed them to what? To create more money, right? right. To, that's what they were basing all of their currency on. So the way you grew your economy back in the 1500s was to go invade other countries, take their gold, use that gold to print more money, and then you have a bigger economy. Well, we don't have that today. It's very different. In fact, in 1971, we said that the dollar went off the gold standard. In 1973, uh, that was replaced. This was a problem. I mean, many people don't, if you haven't studied this, this is a really big problem because in 1971, it, the international economy was in, in a state of chaos. Uh, the, the French and the Germans and many other uh foreign nations were dumping the dollar, trading it for gold. Why? Because all through the 60s, you had, uh, you know, LBJ's and Kennedy's and, uh, and of course, Nixon's ongoing war in Vietnam, which was not being paid for. Uh, you had the Great Society spending by LBJ. I mean, you had all of the, the war on poverty, you had all of these things going on in countries around the world who still had convertibility said, we're not, we're not interested in this. We want to trade in these dollars for this crazy deficit spending is insane. We want our gold back. And that's why Nixon finally had to close the gold windows because everybody wanted their gold back. And so he said, if we continue this path, then we're going to lose all of our gold and then we're going to be a paper tiger. So he shut it down. In 1970, that was in 1971, if we fast forward just a couple of years, the dollar is sinking because countries are, quite frankly, they're pissed. I mean, this is a big deal. And so by 1973, in order to shore up demand for the dollar, uh, we see the advent of the petrodollar system, which we can, oh, yeah. which we can get into, you know, uh, later today. But, you know, that, that basically uh, delayed the pain, so to speak. It, it is actually a brilliant move. Um, because now it's backed by oil instead of gold, right? Exactly. Well, backed yeah, exactly. by our military. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to, be, to be more accurate, I would say. Well, explain Explain that what a petrodollar is to our audience. Yeah. And well, let's first, and you had mentioned inflation. I think this is so important because all of these ideas and concepts are so convoluted mm -hmm. and they, they seem sometimes irrelevant to people. They say, why do I have to care about this? This doesn't make any sense. You know, when you think about working out, you get tangible benefits from it. I mean, if you start you know, taking a pill or take, start taking a supplement or do a certain exercise, you're going to get a benefit from it. But thinking about this, you think, what's the benefit to me? How do I benefit from this? Well, this is what our book is about. If you understand understand these concepts, you can actually leverage them to your own benefit. And this is what we teach in the book, how to live in this debt-based economy. But back to inflation, let's assume something. Let's assume that all of us are on a deserted island. We are going out to play golf. We all have golf balls and golf clubs. That's all we got. And we end up on this deserted island and you got 10 golf balls. We all got 10 golf balls each. There's four of us. All right. So we got 40 golf balls and we decide, hey, we're going to have to probably be here. Nobody's going to find us. We got to use money of some sort. And so we decide to use the golf balls as money. Okay, so the next thing that happens is maybe I find some shelter. Maybe I find a cave and I say, look, I'll let you guys have some, but you got to give me, you know, I'll let you have some shelter, but you got to give me some golf balls. That's our money. And let's say I charge each of you five, right? So it'll take half of your money. As you're getting ready to hand those golf balls to me, 
And as I'm getting ready to give you entrance into my shelter that I've discovered, we hear a loud sound in the sky. And we all look up and we see a helicopter, big helicopter. And there's a big crate falling from the sky. Full of golf balls. That lands right on the, right on the beach, right in front of us. And there it is. And it says golf balls, one million count. What does that do to the price? Do I still want five? No. No, because now we got a million to share. So inflation is the injection of fresh currency into the system whereby the prices of everything can then rise. You can't have, I could not charge you, for example, uh, a million golf balls for that cave before the box landed. (laughs) Because that would be impossible. You would say that's insane. Of course, we could not Mm -hmm. do that. But once we have the new influx of golf balls, the price of everything can rise. Therefore, if the money supply rises, the cost of everything can rise. If the money supply shrinks, everything goes down in price. Mm. And so this is a very important thing to the petrodollar system. So with that laid, what the petrodollar system in essence did in 1973 was that it was was an extension of... Uh, a deeper extension, thanks to President Nixon and his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, that basically took the oil coming out of the ground in Saudi Arabia. And we made a deal with the Saudis. The United States made a deal with the Saudis that basically said every barrel of oil that is extracted in Saudi Arabia must be priced in U.S. dollars. This is 1973. Automatic increase in demand for dollars. Exactly. Automatic increase in demand for U.S. dollars. And this is key because how else can you print money unless you have some extra artificial sources of demand that exist out there? So this was brilliant on the part of Kissinger and and Nixon. And what did the Saudis gain from this? Why would the Saudis do this? Why, Why wouldn't they charge their own currency? Well, because the U.S. said, look, There's big bad Israel here right next to you, and they really don't like you. You've already invaded them several times, and they want to take you out. We'll protect you from from Israel. Uh, In addition to that, we'll give you some weapons. We'll give you some weapons. How about that? And we'll give you some military support. Uh, And so they started basically uh, offering military support, aid, and protection to the Saudis in exchange for a simple task of discharging dollars for the oil. Pretty soon, other countries, other oil producing countries in the Gulf region said, hey, this sounds like a great idea. So by the time we reach 1975, pretty much all of OPEC in the Middle East, all the OPEC nations are in the petrodollar system. And basically what they do is they take the uh, the dollars that they receive for the barrel of oil, they turn around and they plow them right back into U.S. treasuries. So it's a double loan to the United States. And in exchange, Saudis get the kind of treatment that you see them get now on the television every mm-hmm. single day of the week. They get they get prime press. Anytime they want to say something negative about their enemies, the red carpet gets rolled out. Uh, Iran doesn't participate in the petrodollar system. Did you know that? You know who else doesn't? Venezuela. You know who else doesn't? North Korea. You know who else doesn't? Syria. You know who Oh, there's your All axis the countries of evil. that we fight. Yeah. <laughs> All the axis <laughs> of evil. So, but what this does for the United States is so powerful is that because everybody needs oil and because they have to buy from these big oil producing countries, because they use dollars, it takes those dollars and it kind of moves them out of the system, but they still exist. And so it creates the ability for the Fed to print money when we end up in a problem. If we didn't have all of these artificial sources of demand, i.e. through the petrodollar, then the Fed couldn't just print money every time there was a problem because it would create what? It would create that golf ball situation. There would be massive inflation. But because those golf balls get dispersed throughout the whole world and because every country has to hold these golf balls or the dollars to buy oil, they it allows us a great, what one uh, great economist has called an exorbitant privilege. That's what we enjoy today as the, as the global reserve currency. Over time, countries don't always maintain the global reserve currency. Britain had the pound, uh, which was the global reserve currency of the 19th century. Uh, The 20th century was certainly ruled by the United States. Who will rule the 21st century? That's a big question. I don't think it's going to be the U.S., predominantly because we have massive amounts of debt. Our national debt is $21 trillion. Our unfunded obligations are through the roof. Our entitlement spending is out of whack. Uh, And there is absolutely positively no sacrifice or a will for sacrifice. Mm. So in this environment, 
you simply see other nations that are a bit more um, uh, clever and discerning using uh, our weaknesses to their benefit. I see this in China. I see this. Explain that a little bit. Uh, well, even well, Russia. Russia's even been toying with the idea of creating their own gold back currency or buying oil through their own currency, which you exactly. want to start a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a beginning to war. I'm, there's two statements I want to make before I, I, you know, you continue. The first is, you know, uh, I mean, Osama bin Laden, who, by the way, used to work for the U.S. when, the, when, when Afghanistan was fighting against the Soviets said explicitly the reason why he hit al-Qaeda attacked the U.S. is because we have bases in, you know, these Islamic countries like Saudi Arabia. So a lot of this, this is a lot of the stuff that's happened in the Middle East is backlash from us being in there and... Because of the make, petrodollar. Because of the petrodollar, yeah. making these deals. And the second thing with inflation is, again, because I think when we say inflation, people... A lot of people just have no idea. I think economics, the, one of the biggest, the worst ignorances that we have in this country is just lack of basic understanding of economics. And so we end up getting screwed without even realizing it. Mm. Inflation is literally no different than a tax or someone taking your money. So if you have $10,000 and that money in the bank, it's just sitting in the bank, you got 10 grand, but a year from now, it can only buy $8,000 worth of stuff. You've lost $2,000. Mm -hmm. So inflation is literally stealing your money. It's, and it's, it's a tax that people don't realize because they're not paying a tax like they do when they pay taxes. That's right. But it's actually no different. Well, we could argue the Federal Reserve is the biggest gangsters in the world. Well, I was just going to go there. <laughs> right? I, I wanted to go there with you, because you, you mentioned the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. Let's talk about the Federal Reserve for a second. I was blown away 10 years ago when I learned that the Federal Reserve was not a federal it's entity. Private, privately owned. It's as federal as Federal Express. <laughs> a, so what is the Federal Reserve? like? How did they become, like, okay, first talk about who they are yeah. and how they became what they are. Well, this, is, this, is, uh, this was the death of Britain. Uh, the, this was the death of Britain. This is with the rise of the United States. Central banking has been a problem for four or 500 years. Uh, the Central Bank of England, the Bank of England, uh, began back in the 1600s. And what these banks do is they've come up with a very clever kind of mechanism uh, that they call fractional reserve banking. And so our banking system today, our monetary system is extremely uh, creative. Let's just call it that way. It's very creative. It's almost alchemy. Um, you could almost compare it to that. So let's first begin by just taking a look. If you have a dollar bill in your pocket, you can really just literally take one out and look at the dollar. Many people don't have never looked at a U.S. dollar closely. And at the very top, it's very interesting because in you know, maybe several decades ago, <coughs> at the very top, it said silver certificate. Now, at the very top of your dollar bill, if you pull one out, you look at the very top, it says Federal Reserve. You know what the word says? Debt. Well, no, Federal Reserve, well, basically. Yeah, yeah, it is debt. Yeah. Tender. Uh, Federal Reserve note. No, yeah. So if I say I have a car note, you know what that is, right? <laughs> when I'm holding this, I'm holding a Federal Reserve note. <clears throat> not, a, not a bank note as if it's something that's of value to me. It's actually a piece of debt that has been provided to us by the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, even though in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, the coinage of money and the circulation of money is an express right of the Congress and not for anyone else. They outsourced this in 1913 to the Federal Reserve, and they let them do it. And so the Federal Reserve, a bunch of banksters, put out dollar bills that are notes. This is the most crazy thing that I've ever discovered in economics, and I still cannot get my, my, my head around it. But if you're listening to this and you're wondering, think about this for a moment. The Federal Reserve note is a Federal Reserve debt. This means that this thing is a piece of debt. It is nothing else but a piece of debt. This has to go back to who? It has to go back to the Federal Reserve. It belongs to the Fed. It even says at the very top it belongs to the Federal Reserve. So they've lent this to us at interest. <laughs> who charges it's the, the interest? It's the biggest swindle of all time. It's, it's a great right. swindle. And who, and who, uh, char who gets to set the interest rate on what they're going to get paid? They set hmm. the interest rate. on. So it's a total scam. <laughs> but these dollar bills, when you really think about it, they're not backed up by anything. So they're pieces of debt. Money itself is debt. That is the hardest possible thing for us to get our minds around. But money itself is debt. And this is why we wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation, because in the end, 
This is unsustainable. We think that in the long run, the Federal Reserve really should be ended. It has no it has no real mandate in the Constitution at all. It was simply written in through an, through uh, uh, you know through clever uh, policies. But the Federal Reserve, as you stated, is it's not federal, right? It's federal as Federal Express. It has uh, it is basically a bunch of private banks that work together that make a nice living off of being a leech on the U.S. economy, providing us with a debt-based currency that has no value in the long run. Now, other countries know this, and other countries operate in the same way. So we shouldn't necessarily suggest that, you know, somehow America is worse than all the other nations. But it is in this respect, in the fact that it is the dominant one. So when you look around the globe, most currencies are fiat. But the United States is the largest fiat currency. It's the largest currency of this type. And so the bigger they are, the harder they fall, so right. to speak. Yeah. Do you do you think that ours if ours if ours were to collapse it would make everybody else's collapse too? I think that you would see runs into gold. I think you would see runs into uh Bitcoin. You know, I'm a I got to admit, I'm I'm kind of a crypto fan. I started investing in cryptos back in 2013. I bought Ripple and Bitcoin uh, and uh, Ethereum later on. I started buying anything that came on Coinbase. As soon as it would come out on Coinbase, I'd start buying it. And so, you know, this was Ethereum, uh, you know, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin. So we have uh, about 10 different cryptocurrencies now in our portfolio, and many of them done, have done fantastically well. I think that you're going to see movements into cryptocurrencies and other competing currencies over time. Uh, but I think if the dollar suddenly sunk, yeah, it would definitely hit the whole world. But I think other nations could capitalize on it. I think that's what you're saying, as you had mentioned, that Chinese and the, and the Russians are moving together to form, you know, kind of a, a c- competitor to the United States dollar. And uh, I don't think that uh, it's going to take, f- but it may be a few more decades before uh, the dollar really reaches the end of the road. I, I'm not one who thinks it's going to end tomorrow. I don't think that the U.S. dollar is going to fall off of a cliff. It's far too integrated, but it's going to be a slow. In other words, let me say it this way. If you have to die, how would you rather die? Would you rather fall off of a cliff and it be over instantly? Or would you rather roll slow down death. a slow grade and hit every rock on the way down? That's what's going to happen to the dollar. That's what's happening lately. It's a slow, steady, humiliating grind down. And that's what's happening to us. And it's a very sad thing. Um, most people won't wake up. We were just talking about the cost of living out here in San Jose. It's that way many places of the world or many places of the United States, you know, people can't make ends meet. Uh, it's a time bomb. Uh, corporate debts at all time highs, U.S. consumer debts at all time highs, student loan debts, uh, mortgage debt, uh, corporate, as I mentioned, corporate debt, uh, federal res- or the uh, federal government debt. You know, we have a national debt of twenty one trillion. It's just debt galore, and our money is debt. So it's a time bomb. Yeah, a lot of people don't uh, don't realize just how important the money system is. The money system, literally, if that if that goes down, uh, that is the destruction of. Uh, modern societies, we know it. If it collapses, that's how, when you look at the, the, the collapse of societies, that's how it begins. Rome, uh, you know, the, the empire of Rome had a problem like this. And there's a very predictable sequence of events towards the very end. What usually happens is the government uh, uh, runs up debt more and more because they're trying to squeeze out everything they possibly can because a lot of this printed money first goes to the big players. So, so before we see inflation, you know, the banks and stuff, they get to spend all that money. And then it, when it hits like regular people is when the shit really starts to hit the fan. And you had mentioned that the government has the legal authority in the Constitution to mint its own money. And people are always like, well, why haven't they? Why don't they? The last person who tried to do that was, I think it was Kennedy, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it was a few months later, we know what happened to him. So it's, it's, very, it's a very, nobody approaches it. In fact, the Federal Reserve, have they ever been audited? No, I don't think they've never been audited. No, and th- and that we is- have no idea what they do because they could actually they print the money. They could actually do whatever they want with this money. They can do whatever they want to do with the money. Uh, in 2008, we discovered from research they were giving money away to foreign banks. <laughs> it was all kinds of stuff. But you know who else hasn't ever been audited it is the Pentagon. 
And that's another mass. And they, and by the way, President Trump wants. Didn't somebody say, or maybe it's your book? I think I read this. Sorry to interrupt you, but I, on that point, isn't the Pentagon the one that's like every year on average they have like a five hundred million dollars oh, like missing mi- something million? Like, yeah, so I think it's billion. I think there are trillions now of, of money that the we don't Pen- dollars. The Pentagon is the biggest welfare queen in the United States. Oh shit. Biggest welfare queen in the United States, the Pentagon, six hundred and six hundred six hundred and eighty six billion dollars uh, is in Trump's fiscal year twenty nineteen budget for the Department of Defense. No audit, no question of where the money goes, no concern of where the money goes. Uh, you and I, by the way, are financing and funding the bombing of people all over the world, whether we like it or not. Drones. I mean, I've talked to some of these guys who operate these things. This this thing is very real, and it's why many people are. This is why many people. This is why we're pushing our luck with a Federal Reserve note. This is why we're pushing our luck with the petrodollar system and pushing our luck with bases all over the world to protect our economy. Is that the people at one point are going to rise up, and they're going to rise up against us? You and I don't see that uh, from where we stand. Everything seems fine, and. When you go overseas, you find that most people don't hate Americans. They hate the American government. They hate what the American government represents. They hate, they resent, uh, you know, our military. They, they resent our aggressive economics. And uh, so I think one of the things in the book we really help people do is to, to wake up to this mentality that we've all been kind of lulled to sleep in this very cozy environment where it seems like everything's okay. But it's not okay in other parts of the world, but it's okay here. And I think one of the things that people can do is they can wake up and realize, A, money is debt, so I've got to be a little more cautious about how I'm thinking about my financial life. Secondly, they need to be be thinking about how to be a producer instead of a consumer. One of the things we talk about in the book is the consumption trap. And this is so unbelievably important. I was in Houston, Texas in 2012. I was sitting in a my massive home in Houston, Texas, beautiful house, right on the water. We were living the American dream, you know, in Houston, my wife and I, in Houston, Texas, Jennifer and I. And uh, I was sitting in my chair, my lazy boy watching te- <laughs> watching television. And I had this moment, I was holding a bottle, I'll never forget this, I was holding a bottle of water in my hand. And I literally had this thought, I looked at the bottle of water in my hand, I was the commercial came on or whatever. And I was looking at the bottle of water in my hand. And it said like made in Mexico. And I started thinking about the chair I was sitting in and I thought, this is probably not made anywhere near here. You know, I have no clue where this was made. I looked at the television and I saw this stuff beaming at me. I thought, no, this is all outsourcing. I'm outsourcing my entertainment. So I got up and I started looking around my house. I said, now, what have I made in this house? Because 100 years ago, 200 years ago, three, everything you had was what you made or, you know, what you had spent a lot of time, you know, uh, working hard to get. Right. Today, we have everything at our fingertips, and we make nothing. And so I walked around my house. I looked in the fridge. I looked in the cupboard. I looked in my closets. I mean, everything was made somewhere else. And I realized that, I, you know, I was not really a producer. I was, a consu- I was an expert consumer. And so what I did was I started thinking, what in my life can I begin to produce instead of simply just outsourcing? It seems as if the richer we get in America – the more we outsource our production. Hmm. Outsourcing production is how you end up on the hamster wheel. Uh, So we're born in this society today where everything around you is just kind of default. So if you're gonna if you're gonna be a success in America, you have to go live in a big city, right? It's very expensive. You uh, everybody gets running water, right? Even though you maybe you shouldn't even be able to afford it. You got to have running water. You got to have a car. You got to have transportation. You got to have this. You got to have that. You got to have clothes. You got. You start thinking about all the things you got to do, and you never break free financially because you're stuck in the game. And so what we teach is the importance of breaking free from the consumption trap. Thinking about what what is it that I consume on a regular basis that I could actually produce. And maybe even push it a little further and say, not just produce for me, but maybe produce for others and turn this thing on its head. And so one of the things we teach our members at followthemoney.com and, of course, readers of the book is to uh, be a producer you know, and think more like a producer, not like a consumer. Uh, it's a little challenging at first, but that's why my wife and I, after this experience, we really had a good talk. We decided to move away from the city. We moved out in the middle of a rural area. 
we started raising our two young boys there. We have a, a couple of small boys and, and uh, we are growing food. We're getting off of the grid. We see the thing coming down the pike. There was just a story that came out last week about how uh, Russia, which is all over the news, uh, ha- has actually gotten access to all of our power grids, you know, to our power grids and, and many uh, and the electricity. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time before the lights go out. That's my opinion. The lights will go out. Um, and when the lights go out, you're going to find out real quickly uh, who's a producer and who's a consumer. Mm. I've always thought like, a, you know, if we have another war that it's not going to be fought with missiles and rockets, it's going to be more shit like that where somebody finds a way to shut all of our tech down. You know, yeah. like, what the fuck would we all do <laughs> if we woke up and our computer and our phone didn't work? That's like, right. we, I mean, how many people would literally just, just chaos would yeah. freak out. So I really think that the future of war will look something more well, like it's, that. It's, it's, it's money wars, it's trade wars. It's, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's kind of how it, it all starts. But uh, talking more about uh, cryptocurrencies, because those are, they're all over the news right now. They seem to be getting more and more popular. Is a cryptocurrency uh, a fiat currency? Is it also backed by nothing? Or why would I buy, why would I invest in a, in, in a cryptocurrency versus, you know, just a dollar? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, there's a lot of hesitation towards cryptocurrencies today. And I think it's understandable. But there, there really should be hesitation about this. You know, there really should be more hesitation about this. Uh, and what I'm saying this, I'm referring to the U.S. dollar. Um cryptocurrencies, like think about Bitcoin, for example, there's 21 million that'll be mined total, right? 21 million. That's all that'll ever be mined. And that's the blockchain technology, right? Like, like the you, blockchain you can't possibly make more or whatever. Can't make more. And now you can fork it, right? Uh, and you can make more, you can make another type of coin, which is where they split, kind of like a stock split or something. But uh, so you can make a different currency out of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin itself, Bitcoin proper will never have more than 21 million. And so you think to yourself, well, gosh, if there's only 21 million of them and we live in this world of ever increasing money, well, eventually money is going to flow into those because those will be considered assets. And we're slowly seeing financial advisors tell their high net worth clients to move into Bitcoin. So you think, gosh, you know, how many people, how many high net worth individuals really need to buy up one or two Bitcoins right. before you have some real high prices? So I think we've seen some really big moves in cryptocurrencies December of 2017 our port our cryptocurrency portfolio reached its height it then crashed in January and of, of 2018 and and uh, even into February I think we're setting up for another boom bust in that in that area and I think the boom bust in cryptocurrencies is largely determined by uh, faith in the in the United States dollar so as you see the, the faith in the currency go down you're going to see these alternatives rise gold, silver, and cryptos. Are they following the same, like is gold and Bitcoin follow a same kind of up and down path? No, no, they're not. But that's what I'm looking for. And in fact, that's one of the things that I forecast is that I think when you see, because right now the dollar has been sinking. It's been sinking for a lot of reasons. But, uh, But whenever we finally see gold, gold has been stuck in a sideways grind for a while. Silver has been stuck in a sideways grind for a long time. When those both begin to break out again, uh, and you have cryptocurrencies rising alongside them, both rising, I think when you see that, that is indicating to everybody who has eyes to see that uh, the United States dollar is on its last leg. Mm. So I think you'll see people moving into other alternatives. And again, Gold and silver had a huge run in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. And then people kind of forget and they go back to the dollar again and things kind of, you know, kind of got Mm -hmm. back to the same. But I think cryptocurrencies for sure, if you don't have any in your portfolio, I'll tell you what I've done. I've taken 5%, 5% of my total investable assets. That's money I could put into real estate or stocks or I could put it into my own business or whatever. That's the investable assets I have. I took 5% of them and put them in cryptos. Right? So if they all, all go to zero, I mean, I'll be all right. I still got 95% of my investments. <clears throat> but that 5% that I put into cryptocurrencies since uh, 2013 has become unbelievably large compared to what I would have expected. It was one of the best places I could have put it in retrospect. I think that's going to continue to be a story, uh, especially if you stick with the high quality ones. Again, Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Ripple, 
I think some of these are, are the ones that you want to focus on. Now, why? what, what are some of the, the, I guess, the benefits of using a, a cryptocurrency versus just buying gold and, and hedging like that? I think you should buy both. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, currently I have about 15% of my total investable assets in physical gold, physical silver, another 5%, as I mentioned, in, in uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. So I'm more, I'm more bullish, of course, on gold and silver long term, but I still want exposure to cryptos. So I don't think it's an either or. I think you should have mm -hmm. both. What's the, what are the benefits of Bitcoin? Like, why would anybody, what, is it easier to use? Is it easier to, uh, like, what are the benefits of it or what are the, the, the trademarks? Yeah, there's lots of benefits to it, but I, I think, I think the main takeaway is that uh, it's, it's finite. And in a world where nothing is finite, you know, mm -hmm. everything can be printed. It's one of the few things that can't. And so I think that gives it a tremendous attractive value in this environment. And Bitcoin over time, again, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I mean, think about Bitcoin. I mean, back in uh, 2013, when we first started investing in it, hardly anybody was talking about it. It was very little. Right. It seemed like 2017, everybody started talking about it. Bitcoin is known everywhere in the world, everywhere. I mean, there's hardly any country that you can go to where they have not at least heard about Bitcoin. How many brands can say that? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's a brand that's never going to go away, in my opinion, and there's only 21 million of them. So you're going to see throughout time, you're going to see speculative manias in this small, because you can corner it. Just like you could corner silver, you could corner gold. You can corner this market. So I think over time, you know, uh, you're going to see a lot of booms and busts. And I think that, you know, if you like to speculate, you know, it's an easy place to go. There's a lot of cheap cryptocurrencies too. You can look at some of my favorite cheap ones are ones like Tron, uh, and uh, which you know we we've been buying from uh, when it was just a fraction of a penny. Also Cardano, which is currently trading for like twenty cents. We see that one going to five or ten dollars easily over the course of the next few years. So I mean, there's a lot of opportunities in cryptos. Is there any worry that people have about the accessibility to it? You know, as far as the platforms that uh, you know you can access your your Bitcoin from? Yeah, well, I think yeah, and I think there's worries about regulation and all of this, and we should be worried about that. I mean, that's the, the one I'm worried most yeah. is the regulation. Is I feel like yeah, because I feel like the Fed is gonna if they see this being used as you know because what what just came out articles just came out talking about how. And I forgot who talked about this, who said that, uh, you know, they're worried about Bitcoin being used to finance terrorism and the black market mm. uh, for drugs because Bitcoin also has the attribute that it's untraceable or hard to trace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people are buying drugs online with them, buying weapons online. And they're, whenever I see they use the word terrorism, I know like, oh, okay, here we go. Here goes the war now on yeah. cryptocurrencies. Yeah, coming. yeah, the bad guys are using it. So therefore we're going to try and shut it down. And I think was it Google and Facebook stopped advertising they did. cryptocurrency. So yeah, what like what do you think the war is going to look like? Because I for sure, how are they going to possibly sit around? Bitcoin continues if that starts to outcompete or look like it's going to outcompete the dollar. They have to do something, right? They do. Yeah, there's there's going to be a war. The war's already started. Uh, we expect the war to be uh, brutal. Uh, but there, in the end, it doesn't matter because with Bitcoin, do I have any Bitcoin? Try to find out. Try to take <laughs> yeah. try to take my Bitcoin. Just try to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, come out to my house with a gun and say, I'm going to take all of your Bitcoin. Just try it. Right. How are you going to get it? You can't get it. Now you can get my gold. You, know, you could, you could take it out of my vault. You could find out I have a vault. Mm. Bitcoin is this Bitcoin was created. If you read the white paper, it was created because of the federal reserve. Mm. It was literally created because of the federal reserve. They said, we want a finite amount of money, uh, that cannot be hijacked and that cannot be duplicated or printed now, it has a mysterious origin to it. I was so, going to say, isn't, yeah. <laughs> isn't there still mystery around who actually is sure. the creator? And there's like, I think I've read there's like a collection of 12 or 20 of these brilliant yes. free market minds that all came together and they play this kind of game of charades so you can't tell who's who's responsible for it. Is that how that worked? That's right. And I think for that reason, it's important for you to be diversified and not to put all your money into it. You know, I mm -hmm. think if you got all your money in Bitcoin, you did something wrong, you know. But if you got a small amount in it and you're just speculating and you're spread out across a few of them, I think over time, you might be real surprised. It might help that retirement plan. It's a small gamble. Well, I was just, who was it we were just talking to? And my argument to this was, I don't care if the the Fed comes in and we see crazy regulation. I think it's already a proven model that the black market will make it survive alone by itself. Yes. And I say this just being somebody who I came from uh, before we did Mind Pump. 
for about four years, I was around the medical marijuana industry and I was a part of it during a very, very gray area. Mm -hmm. And that, if that was an option for me, then a hundred percent, because I've, I lost a lot of money dealing with that because there was a lot of theft and a lot of bad stuff that was going on. And even being somebody who is doing something in this kind of gray area, I would rather put my money in something like that, that I know it's protected. So, and I, and I'm talking about an example of just like medical marijuana, I know the black market is freaking huge worldwide. And so I think that regardless of what regulation we see, if you're somebody who recreationally uses drugs every now and then or does something that you want to protect yourself and and say and you want it safe like i want to know this is the best place that was a what was that company it was a guy off of a, which um you talking about that website yeah what silk was road yeah was silk, Ro- yeah. silk road was an example of this that of course we tried to mm. demonize that and make it look so bad and that oh that's what everyone's buying this big actually for. increased demand on silk road and that guy got arrested <laughs> right 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 it increased demand and, and what what we found out was actually it was it was now safer it was better we saw less crime. You see all these other things that were a positive thing, even in something as dark as the black market. So I think regardless of what we see happening uh, with regulation and whether this goes uh, global for us and becomes the new currency, I think no matter what, it's here to stay just for those reasons I think this is an example of uh, what the problem that, uh, because government operates through policy, right? Politicians get together, they try to legislate, uh, create a law, that becomes law, and then they regulate industries. And I think the, the problem that tech presents to government is that tech advances way faster than they have time to legislate. So, for example, Uber, no way in hell Uber would have existed had they known that it would have existed. If, had they known, they would have regulated it and it would have never come out. But because Uber happened so quickly... There was no legislations or regulations around it. So it opened in this kind of gray market. Now they try to legislate it. Well, people like it now. So good luck. Same thing with Airbnb and all these other. So I feel like cryptocurrencies are going to outcompete the government's ability to even legislate it. It's kind of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? I think that's I think it's true. I mean, I think it's going to be a constant battle. Uh, It's hard to say who will win in the end. Um but I, I do think that uh, that it's worth the gamble. I, mean, I think it's worth the time spent investing a small amount. I certainly don't have any, you know, outsized hopes mm. for whether they'll survive or not in the long run. But I think, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a it's a wise gamble for a small amount of money. So I have a question for you. A lot of times when presidents get into office, they will use if the stock market is doing well they'll use that as a way to show how well the economy is doing. Like, look at the stock market. It went up. And I'm, of course, if the stock market is doing bad, then they look at other things. <laughs> how how good of an indicator or what are some good indicators that you can recommend people look at to determine kind of the health of our economy? Is the stock market a great sole indicator or is that just a piece? No, it's it's a terrible indicator. And, uh, and in fact, you know, if you look at the the bottom that we hit in 2009 in the stock market, it's so interesting as I think back at this. It, when I wrote the book Bankruptcy of Our Nation, I wrote this book back in, I was writing the manuscript in 2006, 2007. And I could not sell this book to any publisher. First, they're like, we don't know who you are. Who's Jerry <laughs> Robinson? And second of all, why would we publish a book? In fact, uh, the, I think the title I was using was Bankruptcy of America. And they thought, why would we even publish this book? This was in 2007. And I finally found uh, an agent. I started talking to him. He got me a deal only after the market crashed. So (laughs) it was in 2008 when the market imploded. We got like five or six offers from book. We want a bankruptcy of America. But but. Uh, the publisher said, now, we don't want to call it Bankruptcy of America because that's awful. You know, I don't know if we let's call it Bankruptcy of Our Nation. So it shows you how far we've come. Now we say all kinds of things about this and it's no big deal. So back in this time now, the stock market uh, cratered and it really hit its low in March of 2009. At that time, people were fleeing the stock market. We've seen the stock market rally from that bottom all the way up to where we are now. It's been an unbelievable ride in the stock market. And we use a trend trading system. So we were, you know, we were calling a new buy signal on the market back in August of 2009. So this has been an unbelievable rally, you know, for our members and for and for, you know, us personally. Now, the stock market went up underneath President Barack Obama 235%. So if we judge 
president strictly by the stock market. He was one of the best presidents who ever existed, right? Uh, underneath President Trump so far, we've seen the stock market rally about 28% uh, since he came into office. So again, that's a really good return for the short time he's been in office. But the stock market is not a good indicator because really, how many people are really invested in the stock market? A much better indicator uh, to look at would actually be things like the U6 unemployment rate, which is a, a much more important uh, unemployment rate than the one that usually hits the headlines. This includes all of the discouraged workers, workers that have just given up on looking for jobs. We see that number rising right now. Uh, you know, it's not falling, it's so, rising. So compare that with the unemployment number that they use, that they like to report. What's the difference between the two? Uh, like the U3, the, the, the headline number they put out is about 4.1%. The U6, the latest one I saw was about 8.4%. So and double. Rising, so double. Now, why are they different? You, you had mentioned discouraged well, workers all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, how, it's how economists lie with numbers. And they, they are so good with lying with statistics. So they just focus on certain things. So they lump certain things in. Same thing they do with, with a consumer price index. With same thing they do with inflation. It's all what they measure. So they'll measure, you know, how, how fast are the prices rising? Everything but food and energy, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> except the things we use every day. And so I think that, you know, they simply use things like that. So the U3 and the U6, I think that's an interesting comparison. Other things to pay attention to are, you know, the GDP. How, how is the GDP growing? I think that's a, that's a helpful number. Yeah, the GDP is growing, but look at the national debt. It's outpacing the GDP. So our debt growth, I think, across the board is problematic. If we go back and we look uh, at the United States, for every single dollar of growth, every single dollar of growth that we want to create, we have to create two to three dollars of debt. That's we are a debt finance debt finance government. And this is why you say it's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. It just keeps going. In China, in China, if they want to create a dollar worth of growth they have to borrow four or five dollars. So in other words, all of our growth is debt financed. All of it, every bit of it, every single bit of it. When you look from 2009 all the way out to 2018 for nine years, you think, well, look at the stock market. Look how much it's grown. Look at all these corporations. Look at what, how much, have you seen their corporate debt? Uh, have you seen the corporate, corporate debt statements? The debt, the corporate debt has never been this high. So and why has the corporate debt never been this high? Because the interest rates have never been this low. Mm. Now, what happens when interest rates inevitably have to rise on these corporations? What's that going to do to their balance sheets? What's sure. that going to do to their net income? What's it going to do to their earnings? Well, we saw what it did to the housing market. Exactly. And so that's the kind of thing that we see today is it's all debt financed. And, and so many of the economic numbers that we hear about on a daily basis, and you're right, President Trump is a classic offender. He, in fact, I have never heard a president ever take credit for the stock market. Not even Clinton. Uh, Clinton was not even foolish enough to take credit for his, because he had the biggest stock market gain in eight years of any president in memory. And he never mentioned the stock market. He knew better because if it goes down, <laughs> you got to take credit. You too. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. And so Trump, you know, is very interesting in the fact that he's taking credit for this stock market rally. And so when it goes down, you know, it'll probably be, some sort of fake news, you know, when it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> we're also we're also sitting on a massive uh, student loan uh, oh, heavens. debt bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can we talk about that for a second? De student loans, I mean, the, the, the cost of college has become so high. And I think a lot of kids go into college, they get out of school, and what do they do? They just go to college. What are you going to go to college for? Well, I'm just going to go get my basics out Business. of the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go get my basics out of the way, and then I'll figure it out after that. Look, I think a lot of kids should maybe uh, not go to college, you know, to be totally frank with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they do, you know, they should probably pay for it. Uh, I paid my way through college. I mean, I had a little bit of student loans, but I, I paid my way through college working and selling books on Amazon.com. Mm. That's, another, that's another example in the book. One of the ways I paid my way through college was buying books, turn around and selling them on Amazon, Amazon.com as a third party seller and made money doing that, you know, while I was going to college. So, uh, but, but student loans are out of, out of control uh, they, they dangle these low interest rates in front of these, you know, minds full of mush and they take them. Uh, the parents are happy cause they don't have to pay for it now, pay for it later. Everybody loves to pay for stuff later. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's a disaster. And now we have student loan debt at all time highs, credit card debt, the same thing, uh, mortgage debt, the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, across the board. I think well, with, it's with student debt, it's, it's important to note like why, why it's so upside down. Cause 
you get these school loans that are fifty to a hundred thousand, and then the average person with a four year degree comes out and makes X amount of dollars, what, sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. At that rate, even if you're the best saver in the world, it's inevitable you'll ne- almost never pay it'll that off or it'll take you yeah 30 it'll... years before you even come close to Well, I think people so it's important to say that, you know, how interest rates work and interest rates in a market-based system are calculated based on uh, uh, you know, banks saying, "Okay, if we loan you $100, we know at this interest rate we're going to make a little bit of a profit." And I say a little bit because they're competing with other institutions that are loaning you money. And so they're saying it's always competitive. So they're going to make a little bit, but they can't try and make too much because the guy next to you is going to loan it for a lower rate and and agree to make a little bit less. And so markets create accurate interest rates. But what happens with our system is the interest rates are not dictated by the market. They're dictated, well, first off, the Federal Reserve interest rates a monopoly because they're the only creator of money. So they're not competing with anybody. Um, and uh, in student loans is another great example. There's so much regulation and government uh, injection that says we have to loan this much or loan to these people. We have to make it easier because you hear politicians saying education's important. Everybody should go to college. And the way that they then promote that is they make laws and stuff that make it so that banks have to loan out more. Yeah, so it's super easy for some 17-year-old yeah, so, kid to get a loan. So now you go get a loan for $100,000 for a you know political science degree. No way in hell you're going to pay that back if you actually get a job in political science. Mm-hmm. So it's so skewed, and this is why it becomes a bubble, is that nobody then can pay back this money. This is what happened with the housing market. You know, banks were basically told, you know, you have to lend this the, to these people. You have to lend this much. And, oh, by the way... If, if if they default, we'll cover your backs. Well, that creates a crazy signal in the market that's inaccurate. And how's, you know prices go through the roof because you have all this free money. That's why when you go to college, it costs so much damn money. There's no way in hell if, if this was a pure market economy, it would cost you $20,000 to attend uh, uh, you know for a year at a university unless the degree you were going after was like petroleum engineering or something where you know you're going to make tons of money. There's no way in hell. In fact... I think in a market economy, the amount of interest your loan was going to, or, or a loan, a, a bank wouldn't give you a loan if your degree wasn't guaranteed, one of the ones that was going to make a lot of money. Like if you went in and said, oh, I'm going to get a 40 degree in women's studies, they'd say, we're not going to give you money because we know how much that's worth. Instead, mm-hmm. they give you money regardless. And so we've created this this whole problem. Do you think that there's going to be a competitive educational system in the future? Do you, <laughs> I mean, already there, right? <laughs> right. I... Something has to be done about student loans. I think what really needs to happen is I, a competitive education system would be good. I mean, something where people don't just go through the the conveyor belt from okay here. I mean, literally, when you think about education at a at an at a elementary school, or they start very early, they teach you you have to get here at eight o'clock. Uh, you get a break at 10 o'clock or whatever, and then you, you're going to have lunch at 12 o'clock, and then you're going to have recess, and then you're going to – I mean, as you get older, when you go to work, it's the same thing. The recess is the smoke break. I mean, it, it, the uh, the lunch is at the same time. You know, you get there at 8. You, you still have some time, some homework. They are training us from birth to be good corporate employees. Mm-hmm. That's really what the whole thing is. I mean, this is this is this is documented. I mean, you can go back and discover even who funded and payrolled the schools to make them the way that they are, and it was a lot of the big money. So, you can go to, you know, colleges and get a degree that will land you a job at a particular company, and they they teach you everything you need to know about that particular role. I think that um uh, we've gotten to a place where college is just default. It's default for everybody. And I think that's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Not because college can be good, not because college can open your mind, but because not everybody uh, needs a four-year degree to do what they're going to do. We need mechanics. You know, uh, we need people to build houses. We need people to, and those aren't bad jobs, but in our economy, we've kind of separated that. Everybody wants a job in air conditioning with Facebook on their on their on their computer with their own desk and their own cubicle and you know they they want it. this is a this is unsustainable I mean this is not the way the world works right. um, it's also sold to us in the sense that it, it, it's already starting to change because I can access 
any information I want right now for free. If I really, if I'm motivated and I want to learn a subject, I could do it for free you because sure the internet provides all that. You and can, you can take Stanford courses or yep. UCLA courses yep. online for free. Yep. You know. Yep. yep. So it's uh, and and all and what's happening now because the cost of education is so high is people are actually starting to weigh it out. And you, what you're seeing, for example, in medicine, which medicine is highly regulated, right? To become a doctor, there's lots of things you have to pass and tests you have to pass and regulations that say that you can even call yourself a doctor. So it's very not free market. But what's happening with that is if you want to go and be a, and I know this because I've, I have so many friends in the, med, in the medical field. If you want to be a general practitioner, you want to be a family, you know, family doctor, your the cost of your education is still going to probably run you a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars minimum. But a family practice doctor is going to make maybe you know a hundred thousand dollars, and maybe if you're kicking ass, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. People are starting to do the math and say, "Oh, wait a minute, I'm going to go to school the same amount of time as that you know orthopedic surgeon or that specialist." And I'm only going to make this much. There's no way I'll be able to pay back my loan. And so you're starting to see like positions like that start to dry up where a lot of, you know, people entering medical school, you're not seeing a lot of people who or want the to be malpractice insurance, you know, yeah, all the, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't being, aren't doing those, those types of positions now because it's just not making any sense. So mm-hmm. now on the topic of debt, when we talk about the, you know, our government being in debt and it's like something like how many tr- trillions are we now? And 21 trillion. Tri- which by the way, if to give you an idea of how much money that is, that's so much money. Um, I don't, we, we can't pay it back at this point. I don't think we can ever pay, pay it back. At this. We'd have to cut. I mean, we're already in such a deep hole. It's insane. But when we say debt, who's that, who do we owe that to? Like, you know, cause I have people tell me that like, well, debt, what does that mean? Like, it's such an abstract thought. Like, or, do, or if we're at 21 trillion, what's the big difference between 21 and 40 or a hundred or 500 trillion? Like, what's the difference? Who pays that back? You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Well, I mean, it's, it's an accumulation. So the national debt is every single annual deficit plus, you know, combined. So it's a total, total amount. Uh, it's owed to China. It's owed to Japan. It's owed to Europe. It's owed to uh, many of the Gulf states. It's owed to, uh, it's, o- it's owed to a little, lot of little old ladies, you know, who loan money to the government. It's, it's owned uh, to, uh, to the many bank, many bankers. I mean, so you have a whole lot of entities who have their hand out ready to be paid back. And the government, what they do now is they simply can create more money to pay off the debt. <laughs> Inflate but, it. But here's the problem. So we get taxed for it, basically. Exactly. So if we say, okay, let's, <clears throat> this is a perfect example. Let's say that uh, Donald Trump goes to bed tonight, <clears throat> has a dream. He has a dream that he has to pay off the national debt. He says, you know, what? I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to make America great again. And I'm going to pay off the $21 trillion. We're done. We're never going to have any more debt. So how's he going to do it? Is he going to use money in the bank? No. How much money is in the bank for the government? Zero. How much money is in the bank to take care of our unfunded obligations? Zero. How much money is in the bank to take care of your Social Security payment in 2042? Zero. There's no money. There's no money. That's why we call bankruptcy of our nation. There is no money. So it's all future. So let's say Trump says, okay, I'm going to pay off this $21 trillion. He has no money to use. So what he does is he goes to the Federal Reserve and says, let's print up $21 trillion and let's pay this off. Well, then you have another $21 trillion loan that has to be paid back. In other words, the only way to pay it off is with more debt. This is why it's completely (laughs) unsustainable. Even, That's fucked up. It's really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. In fact, there's a statement by the uh, former uh, bank governor of Canada. He was the central bank, uh, Canadian central bank governor. He made the statement. Right? We put it in our book. He said, here's the, here's the crazy fact. He said, if all debt, if all U.S. debt were paid off, there would be no money left. <laughs> this, is, this is the reality. I mean, this has to soak in. I mean, you, I know for some people listening to this, you say, That's crazy. This is the reality. This is why it's so unbelievably dangerous moving forward is that this is the reality. Everything is debt. And so much of what we see when we drive down the road, almost everything we see is leveraged. You know that. I mean, everything you see, cars that are being driven on the road, buildings that, you know, the people have, uh, their homes, their credit cards, their lifestyle, their furniture, everything mm-hmm. is leveraged. And, and, and you know, we're, when people think print money, they also think literally printing money. But isn't money created through fractional reserve banking all the time as well? Yes. 
So in fractional reserve banking, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, a bank, and I don't know what the numbers are, but let's say a bank gets $1,000 in, in deposit, they can loan out up to you know $10,000 or whatever. So they can loan out more because they're only required to have a small reserve. But that money that they then they loan out is basically they've just created that money. And then that money ends up in banks as well because people don't typically take a loan and then just save it. They'll, st- they'll spend some of it and save some of it. That money then is in banks. That becomes more reserve to which then gets loaned out into more. So it's a system of just perpetual it's, it's alchemy. creating. It's alchemy. It's modern alchemy. It's modern, uh, it's modern magic. Uh, the bank, the banksters are the alchemists today. I mean, they're the ones who make things up out of thin air. They produce, uh, nothing. Uh, they, they produce something out of nothing. And that's exactly what the fractional reserve banking system is, is that it allows banks to create money out of deposits that they would not normally have had. Uh, they can loan it. So in other words, for example, uh, I think the latest numbers, and these numbers are always kind of changing the, the Dodd-Frank bill, which is kind of being edited now by the GOP, but uh, which kind of placed some restraints upon the banks in the post-crisis, post-2008 crash, they've been kind of loosening those up a little bit. Uh, This is the course how it works. Right now, we see uh, real estate uh, finance. Uh, We see mortgage finance um, lenders basically starting to loosen up a little bit. Remember back in 2006, 2007, if you had breath, if you could fog up a mirror, you got a loan, you know, (laughs) and you don't have any docs to prove that you make $100,000. Doesn't matter. We don't care. Dude, this is so true. I went to go get a loan and the guy's like, well, don't don't you want to buy a house that's like more expensive? Like, well, I I can't afford it. He's like, it doesn't matter. We'll just put down. (laughs) That's literally how it was. My my first uh, my very first mortgage loan was a low doc, so they said, "How much money do you make?" And I just threw out a number, and they said, "Okay, well, they wanted just a few documents." The second uh, house I bought was a no doc loan, so it literally just no docs. They did not need any information. Now, of course, they reined that in in the post two thousand and eight uh, crisis time, but now we're starting to see that stuff creep up again. See, this is the cycle. If you can learn this cycle, you can profit. If you if you don't learn this cycle, you'll be the victim of the cycle. So it'll happen again and it'll happen again and it'll happen again. And if you happen to be retiring in 2008, uh, how sad, right? you know, it, it, and that's why it's so important to understand these cycles. So since the 1970s, as we talked about at the beginning, since that gold window was shut down, since the petrodollar system was put into place, we have seen these boom bust cycles accelerate and we expect the next bust to be the biggest bust that we've ever seen, wow. ever. Where, and, where, and we would expect the recovery to probably be just as weak, if not weaker than this recovery and longer to get back to break even. So if you have a ton of money in the stock market and you're wildly exposed to this market and you're planning on retiring in the next five years, you could get a massive surprise. Mm-hmm. Jerry, you're, you're, not, you're not the only one that, that is talking like this. Now, I, I've been following economics just as a fan for, I don't know, 10 years and um, you know, my political views are, are libertarian ish, if you will. And a lot of the people in that space were talking about before the 2008 crash that that was going to happen. I remember Ron Paul specifically talking about where this is a big problem. This is happening at the same time. You know, the, 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 the chair of the federal reserve is talking about how the economy is stronger than ever. We have nothing to worry about every, you know, investment banker on CNBC is talking about how great the economy is, invest in the stock market, everything's looking great. And then we had this massive crash. And then you had this huge injection of money into the economy under President Barack Obama. And every one of those same people said, that not a good idea. We're kicking the can down the road and it's going to be much worse the second time around, mm-hmm. you believe the same thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We handled this completely wrong. I mean, the, the we threw more money. We we took a debt problem and added more debt to it. That's all we did. I mean, they did try to put some seatbelts on some things. They did get rid of the the no doc loans for a while, but they'll come back, and they are they're starting to come back. Mm-hmm. They got rid of some of the excesses, but they'll come back. But you know what's interesting is that uh, uh, President Donald Trump just got rid of his top economic advisor. Gary Cohn, who was uh, over at Goldman Sachs. He was one of the top bigwigs over there. And uh, he replaced him with Larry Kudlow. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but mm-hmm. he was a CNBC. He's been a CNBC commentator for a long time. He was on record, just like you mentioned, 
back in uh, 2007, December 7th, 2007, on record stating there's not going to be a recession. Uh, that we, there's, you know, this is crazy. There's nothing to worry about. So this is the guy giving Donald Trump advice is the same kind of guy who was what you just mentioned, ignoring the situation right before the last crash. So we, we are so set up for another massive crash. What, what part of the cycle do you think we're in right now? Do you think we still have, are we towards the end okay. of it, towards the beginning? Where do you think we're yeah, at? Yeah, so I've been trading this market, and uh, even today, like literally, to, I don't want to date this, uh, this interview, but, but literally today, the market was down pretty, pretty severely. Uh, I've been trading this market for a long time. I started trading back in the mid-90s, and um, I actually worked you know, on a commodities uh, trading floor and all of this in the past. And, and this is something that I... Uh, I really enjoy. So trading is something you can do from anywhere. So we love, we were just in Mexico for three weeks. I, we were down there trading on the beach and stuff. It's just a wonderful kind of thing that you can do. And by trading, what I mean is, is investing in a stock or buying a stock and then turning around and sell, like you would flip a house, mm -hmm. you flip a stock, you know, you flip or an option. Well, uh, we've been trading for, uh, through this uptrend since 2009, we had a couple of hiccups. In 2011, it looked like we were going to crash and start the whole thing over again. It didn't happen. In 2016, we saw something similar. It got real funny. Uh, we thought we were going to have a crash. We didn't. And then uh, 2017, of course, as soon as uh, election day, as I mentioned, the market's been up tremendously since uh, Donald Trump was elected. But uh, it does feel like we're near the top. But it also seems as if there is still so much more catalyst. I mean, think think about this. Uh, in the wake of the 2008 crash, the Federal Reserve pumped in trillions and trillions and trillions and tr in fact, there's never been there's never been another intervention like what we saw in 2008 from the Fed. There's never been anything like it. It's un it's unprecedented. And so the amount of money they pushed into the economy, like you said, they took on more debt to fight the debt problem. They pushed all this money in, and you would expect to see something great from that. But in reality, since 2009, what, 10 years later almost, we see still this kind of bumbling recovery of the economic numbers are just okay. People are still complaining about not making enough money. Wage growth is still having a hard time growing. When we see all of these problems and it seems as if that recovery is just taking longer. And this is kind of where we're moving. I think we're moving into a place where we have massive crashes, busts, followed by these prolonged, belabored booms, followed by another massive crash. I think this is the world we live in. Uh, where the top is, I don't know. I, that's one thing that I've been fortunate about. Is that I've, I've said it's going to happen, but I haven't put my neck out and said it's going to happen this day. Uh, there's a lot of my peers who do that for whatever reason, and they ruin their reputation. I think it's kind of silly to do that, but I think it's important to realize that it is going to happen. It's identifiable. Uh, and that's one of the things we teach our members is if you're trading in this environment, you can make money on the way down. You make mm -hmm. more money on the way down and, or you can make money on the way up. You can make a lot of money real fast on the way down. There were some guys that made a lot of money when the house market crashed. Oh man. They made that movie about it. Mm -hmm. Even go back to the, to the, uh, great depression. There was a fellow by the name of Jesse Livermore, who was one of the top traders and he made, I think I forget now how much he made, you know, billions of dollars on the 1929 crash. In fact, JP Morgan actually called him up on the phone and said, stop shorting the market. You're destroying the market. So, I mean, literally, you know, you can make a lot of money on a down in a downtrend, especially today, because you have these things called inverse ETFs, inverse exchange traded funds. So easy for people to buy. So you could buy an inverse ETF. An inverse ETF is simply a, an instrument, unlike a stock. It's like a mutual fund, except it's just a basket of stocks that trades like a stock. And it's like a mutual fund that trades like a stock. And you can buy one that literally goes up when the market goes down. So if you thought the market was going to crash, then you could put some money into this inverse ETF that is designed to go up as the market crashes. Is it made up of a bunch of just shorts? Uh-huh. It's made, okay. up of, made up basically of put options. Oh, got it. On, on, uh, so... And it's financial engineering, but they work. They work very well. So whenever you know, whenever you uh, move into an environment where the market might start imploding, you could just instead of buying stocks, you could buy something that short stocks, and you can make money in that environment. That's what I want for our members. That's what I want for people. Is I don't want them to be blindsided by this obvious uh, scam that's going on in in Washington. That you can protect yourself. You know, you can insulate yourself through smart thinking through observation, and by knowing the right tools. Who do you think are some of the, the 
the best and the worst modern presidents economically with their policies. You can't say they all suck. You have to pick some that are better than others. Yeah. Uh, economically speaking, I, I would say that uh, you know Pre- President Barack Obama was dealt obviously a harsh hand. I, I disagree with many of his policies. So I would say that you know economically speaking, him and you know and again speaking strictly economically, and I would say also President Carter. Had President Carter had maybe another four years, I think maybe what he was trying to do might have worked out. But I would say those two. I would say probably negative. On the positive side, it, it's hard to say positive. It's hard to say positive because because all of them are playing in the rigged game, you know. So they may do something that looks smart, but they're really just perpetuating the scam. Uh, even Ronald Reagan, whenever he slashed taxes across the board, that looks great on paper, you know. But what you don't see is how he financed that, right? Which was a massive increase in the national debt. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that's happening underneath Donald Trump. President Trump is is uh, crowing about how you know he's going to make America great again with the with the economy, but when you actually look at how it's being funded, it's being funded with a credit card. I mean, who's paying for these tax cuts, right? Who's paying for uh, these wars that we're fighting? Who's paying? No. We're borrowing. So literally we're using the people's credit card to pay. So I can't think I can't think of a single modern president mm. that did not use the people's credit card to perpetuate mm. well, their their plan. Well, I know a lot of people think Republicans cut tax, you know, save money, Democrats raise taxes, spend more, but it doesn't I, I don't think political party matter. You look at how they do their economic policies and I mean Clinton you know, actually was probably more uh, free market than Bush was. I know he was, he, he spent less. He cut, I think, wasn't it him who said uh, at his, uh, uh, you know, when he, he was the one who made the claim about going after the debt, right? He, well, he did. And he's because he cut spending. Um, and, and I don't think it was because of him. Obviously, he had a, a Congress that was fighting him tooth and nail. But nonetheless, it's just interesting when you look at Republican, Democrat, it really doesn't matter. You get, you know, deficit. Both of them spend like crazy. Both of them explode the deficits. Um, you know, one charges a little bit more taxes, one charges a little bit less, and then I don't know. We'll see what happens. What about our, what about our our greatest economic lessons that we've had just in our lifetime? When you look at all the things, and we kind of touched on some of them with like housing and school and stuff like that. What are some of the greatest economic lessons that we've had in our time? Well, I I think first of all to uh, good and bad, right? It could be yeah, either because yeah. <laughs> I know we've had a lot of bad lessons, yeah, right? Economic lessons. I would say first of all that you simply cannot uh, get away with not sacrifice. I mean, let's go back to the world to World War II. Uh, back in World War II, you had people who literally said, "We're going to war. We're going to war to, to fight what? We're going to war to fight evil, right? We're going to fight Hitler. We're going to fight Hirohito in Japan. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to." ration, right? We're not going to buy as many groceries. We're not going to buy as much gas. We're not going to buy. And so people actually hurt themselves to help the war effort. I think one of the lessons we've learned today is that people don't want to do that. They don't want to know we're at war. <clears throat> don't tell them we're at war. Uh, and so just go drop bombs and tell the people that, uh, you know, go to Disney World or whatever. You know, that's exactly what George W. Bush did. Yeah, just inflate uh, the currency. I actually didn't <laughs> know that's how that worked before. That's that's, well, that's, that, that's what we had a little bit. We had a gold standard. We had a little bit of a gold standard. So they had to they couldn't just inflate the shit out of the current at the out of the currency like what a, what a much better way to do things that we all have to come to if we're all going to decide wage, we're going to invade somewhere and go war you like, can't wage endless wars with without a fiat currency I don't, I don't think it's possible here's a here's one of the biggest myths one of the most destructive biggest myths in economics and i'll make this statement all day long and this one really pisses me off because it, it's it's a it's a very destructive terrible one and that's that war is good for the economy <laughs> That's a very that's a common one you hear like what got us what got us out of the the Great Depression, you know oh World War II or you know uh, oh a war is good for the economy it creates jobs that is a t- it, it's so false it's not even funny you're creating shit that you're literally exploding so <laughs> we're creating stuff that we're gonna blow up so that's destructive as hell people die that's destructive as hell and all of our efforts are geared towards you know, war when we could have those geared towards other things that the market may be asking one, for. One of the greatest decorated generals in the United States history, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, president, warned in his in his uh, outgoing speech. You can about, watch that on YouTube, by the way. Really important. Yeah. He, he warned about the military industrial complex and how they were fighting to take control of the government. I think that's exactly what we see today. I mean, there's no doubt about it. The military, if, you know, obviously we said they haven't ever been audited. 
Uh, this is not to say anything negative about a military man or a military service man. But what I'm saying is, again, the, the, the Pentagon, the Pentagon, which has all of this money, makes all of these plans. And you know what? Interestingly enough, is the fact that uh, in, in this post, as we, look for, as we look at what's happening now, as we just mentioned, there is no sacrifice when it comes to war. So we are fighting, I don't know how many wars. In fact, there was a report put out just a few months ago saying that it all depends how you define war, but we either are fighting four wars or 85 wars. It all depends how you define them. So we're, we have massive you know, conflicts going on over all the world, and somebody's paying for it. It's China. It's Japan. Other people are paying for our wars. And so I think when you go forward, you think about how is this sustainable? It's not the the military industrial complex obviously uh wants to to maintain its its uh high budgets uh it it wants to maintain and here's the other thing here's the other major thing here's another lesson is that whenever you have a a for-profit defense contractor let's think about lockheed martin or let's think about some of these other big contractors raytheon these companies, what do they do? They make bombs. They make military-grade equipment. What, are, what do people make stuff for? They make it to be used, right? So you have investors into these companies that make bombs, hmm. okay? And those companies, because they're public corporations, they are under an ob- a legal obligation to maximize profits for their shareholders. Therefore, they don't care if the military drops the bombs in the sea or on people, they just want them to drop them because they have more inventory. It's 2019 bombs they got to sell now, right? Hey, the 2018 models are getting old. They're sitting on the shelf. Oh, we got the 2020 models out now. Take a look at our catalog. And so the bomb makers just keep getting propped up by our by our investing community. And the investing community demands profit. And so therefore, bombs get dropped all over the place. And this is this is one of the things that I think many people don't realize also is that the United States president is the largest bomb seller in the entire world uh, when he his and this is not just Trump. It's anyone. Uh, president Trump's very first visit. You remember where it was? Uh, was it to our greatest ally, Israel? No. Was it to our greatest ally, Britain? No. Was it to, you know, go down the list? No, it was to Saudi Arabia. The very first trip President Trump makes is to Saudi Arabia. What for? Why would he go to Saudi Arabia? To sign billions and billions and billions of dollars of what? Military deals. Then he goes to Asia. For what? To sign billions and billions and billions of dollars of weapons deals. Why? Because that's what the president does. The president is the is the literally the front man for the military industrial Commander complex. Commander in chief. <laughs> I don't I don't think Trump maybe knew that before he got in, but he has certainly played the role very well. Uh, he has sold more bombs. And of course, Obama was good at it, too. Sure. But Trump is, is and, really good. And there's, you know, there's a, the other side of it, too, which is, you know, if you want a country that, you know, promotes or at least at least values somewhat freedom to be the the, the most powerful nation in the world. And there's always counterbalances. And of course, other nations don't spend as much because we do. Like European nations don't have huge militaries, but that's because we do. And there's that mm-hmm. whole side of the argument. But it's so riddled with inefficiencies. It's insane because you also have situations where you have entire towns that are supported by these military, uh, you know, equipment contracts. So you have like this this small town and wherever, and they make a bunch of tanks, Cold War era tanks. Well, now you come into office, you're the politician representing that area. You're going to go lobby your other, po- the, the larger government and say, you know, we can't lose these jobs, even though we're no longer in a cold war, even though the next war is probably going to be fought against terrorists or whatever, and we don't need these types of weapons. Well, we can't just shut down that plant because now it's going to be 30,000 jobs that are lost. So we literally have situations, which you can look these up. These are real. They're not hidden. I'm not, it's not a conspiracy. We actually create equipment and then park it and sometimes fill it with cement so nobody else can use it. So it's like a tremendous amount of waste that we cre- we create because of just the inefficiencies of how government works. So it's not just the total amount of money we spend for the military. I bet you within that total budget, God, I bet you a, a, a scary chunk of it is just a bunch of bullshit waste that we're just throwing around. And, and just to show you how, how bent the American mind has become, imagine if we learned this morning, let's say one of the big headlines on the news today was that 
the welfare office in the United States lost, you know, five billion dollars or they were scammed out of it by poor people. Five billion dollars. Poor people took five billion dollars from the from the welfare office. That would be a bigger outrage to the United States than what you just said. Yeah. And we're talking hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. You know, uh, you know, drop bombs on foreign countries, you know, do whatever you got to do. That's not a big deal. Give the give the Pentagon as much money as they want. That's fine. Get, let the Fed run away with, you know, all kinds of problems. That's fine. But don't let poor people get money. It's the last possible thing. <laughs> yeah. That's because it's, it's scary. It's because terrorism is scary. Right. This is why I always, this is why economics interested me so much. It's because when I tried to look at policy uh, and what we were doing, but I didn't understand economics, it was very hard to make things out. It was very hard to understand yes. things because this guy's making me scared. Yeah. This person over here saying we have an enemy over there. This person saying these people deserve it, these people don't. And so then it becomes this, what you see in politics, it becomes that kind of a game where it's, 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 uh, you know, it's taglines, it's short phrases that sound really cool and kind of scare people or get them excited. But when you learn economics, which is a science, which is- A dismal science. It's a very, yeah, yeah it's a very clear mm -hmm. supply, demand. This is how much, this is how much it isn't. This is, you know, if you raise this cost, this is what happens. And if you lower this cost, this is what else happens. When you look at economics, it's a filter that it's like, it's literally like gla like glasses. Like I remember learning economics and I put them on. It's like, oh shit, everything makes sense now. Like everything starts to make sense. And the one thing that people know the least about uh, especially kids, is economics. I don't learn a damn thing. I don't learn anything about student loans. I don't learn anything about debt. I don't know what a credit card was. I don't know how bank loans worked. None of that stuff. I learned none of that stuff in school. It's the same way with help, with uh, health. Right. You, you, I mean, the things that you guys have learned about health since you guys have been on this journey. Oh, none of it's uh, been through. When did you learn any of this when you were a kid? You know? oh, it's the same no. thing that I learned when I started discovering, you know, economics and money. Like you said, I, I realized they don't teach this stuff. Mm. So, but I think it's intentional. I mean, think about the think think about the medical community today and how, you know, every time I go into the doc and I say, Oh, I've got this or that, the very first thing, the very first thing he offers is a pill. Always. Right. There's never like, well, what are you eating, son? Or are you how are you exercising? Or are are you working that out? It's just a pill every single time. Now, well, who does that benefit? It benefits the it's medical, the whole system, medical man. industrial yeah. complex, right? Yeah. So it's it just perpetuates that system. It's the same thing whenever I were whenever I uh, go into the stockbroker or I go into the financial planners. Typically, he's got something that he's got to sell. He's got a pill, right? He's got something from the corporations that he that he works and con uh, does business with that he has to sell. There's very little holistic kind of planning that goes on in finance, and it's the same way in medicine. Uh, oh, it's all about. I mean, in finance, it's all about debt spending, debt spending, get more debt. You leverage your debt, get more debt to leverage that debt. Yeah, that's. I have a lot of family that's in uh, in banking and finance. A lot of investment uh, bankers, uh, excuse me, bankers and brokers. And when I bring up things like cryptocurrencies, they're like, "No, don't, total waste of your money. Don't do that." And I look at them like, "You're not. Of course, you're going to say that first off because it's competing with yeah. the stuff that you sell." Um, and it, it, these are the same people that were telling people to leverage their homes and get these, you know, these adjustable mortgages and whatever. And, you know, I had friends that got in the mortgage business were like, no, man, buy five houses, take money out of the first one, buy the second one. And I'm like, what happens if interest rates change and go up on all these adjustable, you know, rates? And they're like, oh, that's not going to happen, man. Look, you know, property keeps going up. And these same people now are, uh, you know, all of them went bankrupt. I mean, and, all of them. And I'm guessing if you went into your doctor and explained to him all the things you guys do, uh, they would probably say the same thing. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do this. You know, oh, we talk about it the same way. Yeah. We talk about it all. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are some good basic pieces of advice you could give some of our listeners? We have a very, we have a young audience, um, you know, a lot, probably a lot of them well, don't share, have any money invested. I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your, We off air, we were talking about your your membership website mm -hmm. and exactly what you do there. Maybe you can share some of that for, for our audience also. Yeah, well, I, you know, first of all, things have changed so much. I mean, uh, you know, go back 100, 200 years uh, and retirement was a very strange concept compared to what it is today. I mean, today we think, hey, you know, when I'm 65, I stop working and I sit at home and watch Price is Right and <laughs> do do whatever I want, you know, drive around in my RV and I don't have to work anymore. And, but the kids really aren't going to really help me because they're off doing their thing. And so I've got to take care of my kids. I got to leave something for my kids. That's so con. That's so contrary to what it used to be in the past. Your kids were your retirement, you know, your kids took care of you, you know, so you, 
you, uh, you know, you gave birth to the kids, you raised the kids. And then when you were too old to work, they took care of you. Well, that's not happening today. In fact, most kids don't want to take care of their parents and they'd rather put them in a home or something like that. Sadly, that's really the truth. Or they don't have enough money to take care of them, right? Or they want the parents to give them money, right? It's a very strange uh, dynamic we have today. So retirement, the idea of retirement has changed. And so therefore you have to take control. Uh, If you don't have kids who are going to step in and take care of you, uh, then you got to have a plan because the government's not going to take care of you. They're not going to be around. I mean, uh, they're going to be around, but they're not going to have enough money to be able. I mean, think about how technology is accelerating the way that it is. It's, I mean, if 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 they could extend your life, for example, let's say you end up being seventy years old and a pill is available to you to extend your life due to some dread disease, and it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, would you want to buy it? Of course you would. But most people aren't going to be in a position to be able to shell that out. So you've got to think to yourself, you know, I got to have a plan in place so that I can have a happy end of life situation. And I think there's a few ways to do that. And in the book, uh, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, as you have mentioned, we talk about and in the memberships, we talk about the need to develop multiple streams of income. Uh, In fact, chapter, uh, let's see, chapter what's the chapter number here? 14 of the book bankruptcy of our nation is called 21 income streams. You can create now and in retirement. And I think that's that right there is very powerful. I think the idea of thinking less like consumers, more like producers, and then saying, what can I produce? Most people today have one income stream. Most families, most couples have three income streams, typically a the you know the the husband works the wife works and then they may have a CD that throws off interest. There's three income streams. Jennifer and I and I'm not bragging. I'm not saying you know I'm, I'm not showing off my muscles here, <laughs> but uh, but you know we've worked hard to develop twenty plus income streams. I mean it's taken a long time. It didn't happen overnight, but we but we worked hard. We did it through online marketing. We do it through real estate. We do it through trading. We do it through you know, investing with, I mean, all, you know, different businesses and it takes time, but that's how we think. So we think to ourselves, we need more income streams instead of, I need a job, right? I need a job to pay my, no, you don't need a job. You need income streams. Now that may be a job. It may be three jobs, but when you start to think in terms of income streams and we lay them out here in the book, bankruptcy of our nation, you can develop so many different income streams. And that's really key. The second thing that's important in addition to creating more income, obviously paying off debt. And if anybody wants to, has a debt problem, we have a really cool free document they can download on our website. It's followthemoney.com forward slash debt. And it's just a free PDF. It just literally just pops up when you go to that website. And it's a quick way to pay off debt. So if you're facing debt, you know, that there's that. But once you get past debt, uh, you have to start thinking of how am I going to be prepared for the future? And of course, that means uh, building income streams. It also means diversifying. Most people don't have uh, money to take care of a simple emergency. Most people, more than 50% of Americans, every single time there's a survey, you find out they don't have two pennies rubbed together to take care of an emergency. So the very first thing we tell all of our members is you must, at absolutely must, develop a six month liquid reserve, savings reserve. You must, you simply have to have it. So you have to have six months of your total salary. Let's say you make $50,000. You've got to have $25,000 of that that in savings, not investment. Investments are when you take that money and you lock it away somewhere. No, this is savings. This is hard cash. This is in case shit hits the fan, right? Absolutely. And you're ready. Now, what what could happen? Well, you know, you could lose your job. Uh, you could, uh, the market could tank, uh, all kinds of things could happen. So many people back in 2008, when the market tanked, they lost their job. They had to cash out their 401k at the bottom, you know, because they don't have any money. They don't have any, they didn't have their six months liquidity. So I think, you know, having six months of liquidity gives you the cushion. You're driving down the road, you get a flat tire. You got six months of liquidity in the bank. You're not worried. You're not whipping out the visa. We often rely upon debt because we have no savings. And we're taught that through the big banks. They say, ah, you know, yeah, you can have a little bit of savings, but you know, always have a visa on hand. So they want you to borrow. I think that's very important. Uh, investment diversification. Most people think, well, <clears throat> you know, I, 
I guess I don't know much too much about the stock market, and so maybe I, if I do, I'll just maybe spend put a little money in there. But usually they have a 401k and a house. That's the typical retirement plan for the American, the average American. They have a house, which is a liability. If you've ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, brilliant book, and he says your house is a liability. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, secondly, a 401k. Now, what's wrong with 401ks? What's wrong with IRAs? You know what's you know what's terrible about 401ks and IRAs? They're government controlled. Do you own your 401k? <clears throat> no. You want to know how you you know what, how I know that? Go try to use it for collateral. You you cannot use something for collateral that you do not own. So if you go down to the bank and you say, "Hey, I have a 401k with $100,000 in it or $25,000 in it." They're going to say, "So what?" and laugh you out of the bank. That's not yours. How come it's not yours? Because it hasn't been taxed yet. Once it's taxed, then it's considered yours. <clears throat> now, the 401k is designed for you to put money in, and then when you retire, you know, later down the road, you take it out minus taxes. Now, what are the taxes going to be on that? Well, typically they say whatever your current income tax rate is. Do we think taxes are going to go higher in the future or they're going to go lower in the future? They're going to go massively higher. We think taxes are going to go much higher because... Debt. Because of the debt, right? Mm -hmm. We got all this stuff we got to pay off. Somebody's got to pay for it. So the next generation will probably pay for it, and they're going to pay through, pay for it through higher taxes. So when you go to take that 401k money out, what's the tax rate going to be? Is it going to be higher than it is today or lower than it is today? I'm, I would say if you have 20, 30 years left, it's going to be much, much higher on taxes to get that money out. So I think the typical American retirement plan of a house <clears throat> and a 401k is a is a it's doomed to failure. So we think you've got to be more diversified than that. First of all, if you're looking at a retirement plan, look at a Roth. A Roth IRA allows you to pay the tax man now. And then all of the money that you ever make inside that Roth is tax-free. So I can trade. This is what I, I love to trade in a Roth. I got a Roth early because you can't qualify for them once you reach a certain place. But when you get them early, whenever you're before you make too much money, you can stuff money in that Roth and then you can trade it, speculate with it, invest, you know, in different things and grow it. And all of the growth is tax free. So when you reach retirement, you take all of the money that you put into the Roth and you can take it out as a tax free payment. You never pay taxes on it. So the Roth, I think, for a young person is a really smart idea. I'm not a financial advisor. They would need to talk to their financial advisor, but I think that's a good uh, route. I think owning uh, rental real estate is a powerful way to make money. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where houses are very cheap. Uh, so it makes sense in my, in my community, not every place. I would imagine here in San Jose, it may be a tough kind of income. You got to be build. rich first here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, out, you know, in many parts, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, or, you know, kind of the middle of America, guys who live out there, it's a great income stream. You know, they can buy houses cheap, hold on to them, let the renter pay them off. And by the time they retire, they have five, six, seven houses that they can then sell or, or rent, out, rent out, continue to rent. So I think real estate's a fantastic one. Online marketing. I discovered online marketing in the mid-1990s, and I started making money online about 2000. Online marketing is powerful. It's very powerful. Anybody can do it. Uh, <clears throat> and having done it for you know two decades, I've learned that there are some really important tips, tricks, things to avoid, and ways to do it cheap. Uh, so we talk about some of that in our membership. And, and by the way, our membership is very simple. Um, people can go to followthemoney.com. If they say, listen, I don't know too much about money, but I need a coach. I need somebody to kind of help me understand this stuff. I, I want somebody to maybe talk, you know, help me but with this trading. I got it maybe a few thousand. I might want to do something like that. Or maybe I want to learn how to do how we have a whole income university on our membership. So you can go through all different 22 different income streams and learn about them. You can uh, use our trading software to be able to identify when to buy a stock or an ETF, when to sell the stock or ETF to make a profit. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in our memberships. They can go to followthemoney.com forward slash subscriptions, and there they can see the different plans. And the, and and the membership fee is really minimal, right? <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's anywhere from you know 10 bucks a month to 100 bucks a month, all depending on what they're wanting to do. But the education, I think, is priceless because we've we've brought together so much information that uh, most individuals, as we've stated here, don't know. I mean, it's, it's not common knowledge. Uh, they usually get the opposite of this from the financial advisor. They get the opposite of this from the financial complex, hmm. from Wall Street. So it's 
it's information that people need. But multiple income streams, diversify your investments, uh, you know, focus upon thinking like a producer, not a consumer. Now, these are some of the concepts that have made us successful, and I know that you know can help other people. Well, I think uh, we live in a time now, luckily, where you have access to so much information. I think the first step is just taking it seriously. Like, okay, I want to, and you should when you're young. When you're, if you're young and you're smart about it, you could end up with a really, really nice retirement in in ten years. Makes a big difference. So, and so you don't have to put a lot of money. You know, if you have fifty bucks a month, even you can even use that and grow that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's a great time to find all. There's a lot of free information. Of course, you have people like yourself. Where people can get their their information mm -hmm. from, but Jerry, are you are, are there any companies right now that you that you're fascinated by or that you follow? Are you big into watching like all these? Sure, yeah. I mean, I've been a long time investor in Amazon. Uh, Amazon.com blows my mind still. I, I told you, <clears throat> I made money through college selling books on Amazon. It's one of my favorite strategies for for new people. Uh, you can just literally sell books. I remember this is how I found out. I, I bought a Beatles CD at a garage sale <laughs> back, back in 2000, something or early 2000, <clears throat> like maybe 2000, maybe the year 2000, 2001, whatever. And I, I bought this uh, Beatles CD. I ripped it. And then I said, I'll put it on, I'll put it up on Amazon, you know? And so I went ahead and looked on Amazon. It was selling for 10 bucks. I paid a buck for it at the garage sale. I sold it for 10 bucks. I thought, this is great. Uh, what if I had like a thousand of these, you know? So I started going out to garage sales and started picking up stuff, books and stuff. I found this book called uh, The Handbook of Pest Control. Paid like a quarter for it, maybe a buck. Took it home, looked on Amazon, it was 150 bucks. Oh, sold wow. it like that. So I was addicted. So before I knew it, I was buying books. I put ad ads out. I was buying books and you know, mainly nonprofit, uh, non uh Nonfiction, fiction books don't sell well on Amazon, but not nonfiction books, especially real niche stuff. I mean, it's a great supplemental income. People can make an extra few hundred bucks you know, a month doing that. It's just one little strategy that we teach. But Amazon.com, I'm certainly uh, fascinated with them. I think they have a tremendous way to go forward. Uh, there is there are a few other industry industries in particular that we're very interested in. I think the one of the most compelling industries as we go forward, of course, is is the artificial intelligence and AI. I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of folks uh, focused upon that. There's many different companies, uh, but you know, I think when it comes to when it comes to uh, investing in companies, I think in this environment because we may be at the top, it's smarter to think in terms of short-term opportunities as opposed to longer-term opportunities. I think the longer-term opportunities come in the 2008s, 2009s. That's where you look for those opportunities. Now, at the stratospheric level we are in in the stock market, it's probably smart to be much more shorter-term thinking uh, than it was, say, back in 2009. Right, right. Do you think that, like, getting on AI, do you think, what do you think is going to happen with I mean, I just saw this article on, you know, the, they've now got this robot able to flip the burgers at a faster rate than a human. Like a lot of these minimum wage jobs, mm. I think we're going to see eliminated and replaced by AI. Do you think that's going to serve us better in our economy or worse? What do you think that's going to do? No, I think it's a bad, I think it's a bad uh, deal, uh, especially considering that mo most people don't have, you know, a, a skill. I say most, I mean, literally most of the people that these people's job, the people who are going to lose these jobs, they don't have the skills to go do something else. <clears throat> they don't have the education oftentimes. And so some of the jobs that are going to be uh, lost are going to be permanently lost. Um, I'm not a real big fan of that. And of course, that's leading many of these guys who are promoting artificial intelligence, like the co-founder of Facebook and whatnot, to promote a universal basic income. Or there's a get the government to give all these people money because we're going to automate all the jobs. <clears throat> and so I think we're moving into an environment where we could see some really interesting things. We're already seeing the universal basic income concept where the government just literally gives you a thousand bucks because you're breathing, uh, you know, uh, or $2,000 or whatever they decide. I think we're going to see many more experiments with that. This is how insane our economy is now. They literally print money out of thin air and just give it to you, right? Because you'll go spend it. And that's what that's how the whole economy works. It's all based upon consumption. 70% of the GDP in America is based upon consumption. Uh, that's unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, we are literally a, a country that if we stop consuming, if we stop our crazy consumption habits, we'll destroy our economy. Hmm. So we have got to keep on buying 
the new as seen on TV product. We have to keep buying the latest fads and the and so uh, something's going to give. Something's going to give, and I think AI aggravates that problem. Mm. You know? Unless it figures it out for us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. maybe they're smarter than us. Yeah. Well, hey, man, great time. Yeah, it's been thanks a great for time. coming on the show. Absolutely. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, Absolutely, lot, definitely. And your podcast. Yeah, Follow the Money Weekly. We've been doing that on uh, for a long, long time, since 2010. I know you guys have heard it. Uh, but uh, followthemoney.com is where they can find everything. we got a podcast. we got a newsletter. We've got memberships. We've got a book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. I encourage everybody to pick up a book. And they can typically find this in bookstores. Uh, it's been out for a little bit longer, so Amazon's probably the cheapest place to get it. But um, yeah, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. If you don't know anything we've talked about today, I think that's a great place to start. It'll get your mind thinking in the right direction. Excellent. Mm, awesome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Jerry. Absolutely. What a great it. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>